Hello everybody, thanks for coming along tonight. Put up a poll recently, the sort of topics you might like me to cover and becoming unstuck seemed to be the most popular one. Having said that, it was a close contest between them all, so I will look a little bit at triggers and a little bit at boundaries as well. I can't really go into in depth in them all, but we're looking tonight at becoming unstuck. But we're going to look at why we become unstuck, some of the reasons why we are stuck, why we find moving forward difficult. Then we're going to look at some ideas to help you to move forward, to become unstuck. But first of all, what I'll say is if you have been in a situation, an environment, a relationship with someone who's difficult, toxic, narcissistic, all of the above, that is going to have an impact on you. That's going to affect your sense of self, your sense of state, your self-esteem, your self-confidence. You think of the gaslighting, the rewriting of your own narrative, uh, you're doubting your own thoughts, your own feelings. Coming out of that can also be difficult because we have, if you will, there's a, a residual kind of effect. We find ourselves stuck in different ways. So we're going to outline some of the ways. So first of all, one of the reasons why we could still we still be stuck could be because maybe there is still some kind of contact. Now, maybe the relationship has ended, but there are children involved, so there's some kind of a contact there. They could be family members. It's maybe a family of origin. There's still some kind of contact there. It could be a work situation, so you still have to go into work every day. There's going to be some kind of contact, and every time there's some kind of contact, what happens is we sometimes find ourselves acting, reacting as if we always did, the way we always did when we were stuck in that environment. Hello, Thriving Now. Hello from Ireland. Yeah. And hello, Jealous. Nice to see you as well. I'm glad you like my videos. I'm glad you find them helpful. So we can be stuck, as in there's still some kind of contact. What we also find as well is a lot of rumination. It's one of the questions came up when I put up the poll about rumination. Now, what rumination is, is we think about the same thing over and over again. And the reason for that is a lot of different reasons, but I think the biggest reason is we don't like things that don't make sense. Our brains aren't hardwired to sit with uncomfortable things. We are probably the only creature on this planet that needs to know things we don't know. We need to know what to do whenever we don't know what to do. It doesn't sit well with us. So if you imagine you're in a situation with someone, it could have been maybe a sibling, a parent, a partner. It could be someone that you trusted, someone that you loved, someone that was supposed to have your back. But they were, they were selfish. They were judgmental. They were critical. They didn't show any kind of compassion. Well, that doesn't make sense to us especially if we have invested so much of us into them and it was never enough. So what we do is we ruminate, we think about almost all of those interactions. They keep coming back. We think about the birthday, we think about the special occasion, we, we think about the time we sacrificed, the time that we compromised, but we got little back in return. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Aluda, Sandy Mason, Barbara, it's just Darren keep saying, no doctor, I would like to be the doctor, the Time Lord doctor, but Darren's fine. A high basketball fan, just saying hello to everybody. So where'd I get to? Yeah, we think about all of those interactions. We think about how much it hurt. We think about the things that we might have been able to do differently. We think about why the hell did they do that? Why would someone behave like that? We almost try to go into their head, trying to think of their motivations, trying to think of, you know, what were their motives? We don't like things that don't make sense. Now, the other side of that is if there is still contact and maybe we have to see them, maybe we have to res respond to a text or an email, we have to meet up with them, we have to do whatever, they're going to be in the situation or the environment that we're going to be in. Um, we start to analyze what could happen. What are they going to do? How are they going to hurt me? So we're almost like safety planning and we're thinking ahead. We're expecting something and whatever it is, we're trying to avoid that. So we keep on ruminating, thinking about the same things over and over again. 
Another reason we can be stuck is blame. Now, as much as we know that her person hurt us, as much as we have a good idea of their character and the way they behaved, for some people, they actually blame themselves. I maybe should have done this. I should have done that. I should have said the other thing. A common thing, you may have said this yourself, I've said it myself, a lot of comments on the channels, a lot of different uh, people comment on many different things. Why didn't I see the red flags? So there's a little bit of blame there as well. Why did I not see this coming? When the truth is, you know, when it comes to red flags, it's not like they were waving them in front of you saying, hooray, look at what I'm doing. A lot of the time, they're little, small, subtle things. They're little pieces at a time. It's a small kind of erosion, a little piece at a time. So we don't really see them until we're in the middle of it. But there is still that kind of blame that goes on, not just blame for them, but the blame that we sometimes feel towards ourselves for not doing this, for not saying that, for being in that position in the first place. Because if you had the choice, you wouldn't have been there. But remember, it was that little piece at a time. We also think, I'm going to be very careful how I phrase this. Sometimes we think our recovery and our ability to be able to move on is dependent on them. We need them to acknowledge. We need them to apologize. We need them to say they're sorry. We need them to get their comeuppance. Now, if you're dealing with someone who is narcissistic, that's probably not going to happen. Because if you think of narcissism, which seems to be the biggest thing on my channel, a lot of people ask me to talk about narcissism, there is a very fragile sense of self, a very fragile ego. They have a version of the world, a version of themselves. Reality is too painful. They're not going to have that. To acknowledge they did something wrong would almost be crushing for them. You, I did put out a short earlier on about a narcissistic apology. It's not that you don't get apologies. Rarely. Sometimes you might. But they always come with a caveat. There's a bit of sarcasm. Well, okay, if sorry means such a big deal. You know, or they're sorry because of the consequences they may face. But every now and again, you might get something that is genuine and they do realize maybe they've gone too far and they do regret it. That doesn't last because that fragile sense of self kicks in, the defense mechanisms kick in, and that immediately becomes rejected and it becomes about what you or someone else did. If we think our recovery is dependent on them, we're going to be waiting a very, very long time. The other part of that would be needing some sense of justice. You watch TV, you watch movies, the good guys always win. They always get their, they always get the last word at the end. They always save the day. They always come out vindicated. Sadly, in real life, it doesn't work that way. You know, sadly, sometimes the other person gets to keep the house. They get a promotion. People seem to side with them. We need some sense of justice, or at least that's what we believe we need. And maybe we do. But if we hold on to that, again, that's going to hold us back. We're not really going to be able to move forward because we're still in some way dependent on the other person for us to be able to move forward. Another part, now, this could be, again, it's someone you were in a long-term relationship. I think this would be very common in families where maybe you had narcissistic parents or siblings. That's not how families are supposed to work. Mom and dad are supposed to be there. They're supposed to protect you. They're supposed to encourage you. They're supposed to feel proud of you. They're supposed to, you know, again, with narcissism, that might not necessarily happen. So what we do is we start thinking about, well, what if this had been different? Or what if I had tried that little bit harder? Or what if I had given them what they had wanted? So again, it's a form of rumination, but it's almost like we're trying to rewrite what happened, as if we could have done it better. If it's a relationship that was difficult, there may be that part of us that's thinking, maybe they have changed. Well, it's not for me to say they would or they wouldn't. Again, if it's narcissism, it's 
not likely. Um, I think sometimes what we see is a change in tactic or a change in strategy, sometimes to do the same thing. And any change may be short-lived before they just go back to doing what they're doing again. So we're kind of back where we started. And to make that point, if you think of a relationship you were in with someone who was narcissistic, if you think of that cycle you went through, there was what they would call the honeymoon phase. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Everything is fine. And then there would be a little bit of kind of devaluing. There's jokes with jags, there's criticism, there's things like that. And then there would become some kind of bust up, some kind of punishment for whatever. After that, there may be some kind of change in behavior to show they're not as bad as really you thought they were. So you're back to the honeymoon phase. And it's that cycle that we often go through um, in difficult, toxic relationships, even out of the relationship. Sometimes there's a part of us that remembers the good stuff. Even the rest of it was horrible, but there were good things. And there is a pit of us that might hope that part of them will come back. So there can be that kind of thinking as well. And the last thing I think that keeps us stuck, I'm not saying it's the biggest thing, for some people it would be, and not without reason. The last thing that keeps us stuck is the pain because it hurts like hell. There's no pain like it. I kind of think it feels like we've lost a part of ourselves. It's part of us that invested in them, that invested in that relationship. There's um, that part of us that we poured so much of ourselves into it. It was rejected, it was trampled over. Um, I just see someone's mentioned betrayal trauma yeah you could be with that person you might have been with that person you gave them everything and they ended up they were still cheating they were still seeing other people and it feels as if we're not enough that betrayal that hurts like hell it's it's we have been rejected as human beings we have been rejected and nobody likes to be rejected the pain of the humiliation we went through the embarrassment the way they may have talked to us in public, the jokes they might have made about us to our friends, the way we would have been devalued in front of our work colleagues, that feels, that feels crushing. And again, we ruminate over the pain. We ruminate over those situations and we get stuck. Part of us, I think, is still stuck in that environment or with that person. It's the part of us that maybe hasn't been updated. It's the part of us that still yearns for some kind of validation, for some kind of recognition. It's the part of us that, if you think about it, it's that part of us that if we were to let go of, it would be like we were really, really losing a part of ourselves. And that's not what we want to do. We want it to make sense. We, if you will, we're still somehow enmeshed there. So it's how do we get untangled? So what I'm talking about tonight are just some ideas. These ideas, they could help you on your journey. They're not necessarily going to give you a quick fix because the thing about recovery is it's not a shortcut. It's a journey. It's a process. And it's a little piece at a time. And I'm going to explain later on little ways for you to recognize how you're moving along. Because if we're not paying attention, sometimes we miss it. Recognize as well, that part of us, it's stuck there. It's almost like we're grieving. Now, this is the thing about grief. Grief isn't just feeling sad. Grief is a lot of different things. They talk about the, the, the stages of grief. Now, that sounds very clinical to me. And as much as it makes sense, um, I, I think more along the lines of the different things we feel while we're grieving. I don't think there's a particular order. I think that there's a whole spectrum in between. And I also think we can go round and round and back and forward. But when we're grieving something, it's usually the first thing that hits us is denial because we can't believe it. How the hell did this happen to me? You know, I'm, I'm better than this. Why did I not see this coming again? Why did I not see the red flags? I don't let these people treat me like this. I don't like that people, that person treat me like this. Why the hell? So there's denial. 
what we also start to feel is maybe a little bit of bargaining, I'd rather think rather than feel. We maybe do a little bit of bargaining. What if I did this? What if it'd be different? Or what if I did that? How would it be different? We get angry. I talked about anger last time, how anger is fueled by different things. It's fueled by injustice, unfairness, um, being treated badly. It's feeling shame. It's feeling guilt. It's feeling a lot of different things. And it comes out as anger. So we feel angry. We feel angry at the injustice of the situation, especially if they seem to be having their best life. Especially if they're acting as if they are the wounded party. Especially if everybody seems to be siding with them. We feel anger. We also feel guilt. We sometimes feel guilt because of when we did stand up for ourselves. Maybe we were more aggressive than assertive. Maybe we did things that go against our moral code. Now, I'm not going to tell anyone they were right or wrong, but what I will offer you to think about is a lot of the times when we react we or, or act in certain ways, even, we're doing what we think is the best course of action at that time. And we're not born with the gift of hindsight. But it is a normal thing to feel. We'll also feel depression. We'll feel a low mood. We'll feel a lack of motivation. And eventually, we'll come to acceptance, which I will talk about later on. But they would be the main stages of grief. I don't think there's an order to it. As I say, we go back and forward. We go round and round. And sometimes we can get stuck in one part of it which is another thing that can keep us stuck. But if you recognize you're grieving, you're grieving different things. First of all, you're grieving the relationship and it doesn't matter how toxic it was. But if I put it to you this way, you might not be grieving the relationship. You're grieving the relationship you would have liked to have had. The one that, if you will, you were promised. The one that you want the one you hoped there would have been often that's what we're grieving not necessarily the one that we had you might also be grieving the person if you'd have been with them for a long time or a family of origin let's be honest you grew up with them you've known them your whole life you're grieving them but again you're grieving the version of them that you would have preferred you're grieving the version of them maybe they presented to the rest of the world you're grieving if it was a relationship you're grieving the version of them that you fell for not the real thing and that can bring a lot of things that can bring things like disappointment that can that can bring low mood that can bring depression but grief is a normal a normal thing to feel at the end of a relationship especially a long-term one even if it's a, a very difficult one but recognize your grief you're also grieving a part of that part of yourself i mentioned earlier you could have been with someone six months. You could have been with someone 25 years. It, again, it could have been a family you grew up with. It could have been a working situation you spent too long in. You're grieving that part of yourself that invested. You're, you're grieving that part of yourself that maybe feels as if it wasted all that time. Recognizing your grief. I think is an important part of being able to move forward. We don't want to feel it, again, which might be where some of the anger comes from. Some of the times that anger is directed towards ourselves. But you recognize the loss, the grief, if you will. I said a moment ago about acceptance being the last part of grief. And I touched on this in a previous live stream. One of the reasons we struggle with grief, or sorry, struggle with acceptance, is because sometimes we don't fully understand what it means. Sometimes it can just mean we're resigning ourselves to something, but not always. Sometimes if we acknowledge acceptance, what we're not doing, looking at it the other way around, if you will, accepting something doesn't mean you're fine with it. It does not mean you're okay with it. It does not mean everything's fine and it doesn't matter. We can accept something and it still hurts like hell but we're just acknowledging it is what it is. They are what they are. Maybe they're not for changing. They're not going to say they're sorry. They're not going to acknowledge it. Grieving for the future you planned. Ms. Liberty, absolutely right. That's another thing we grieve. The life we would have liked to have had. The future we were 
if you will, we were supposed to have, the one we promised each other on our wedding day, things like that. Yeah, we grieve that version of that part of us that was lost that didn't get that, in spite of our best efforts. And that can bring up a lot of things. Again, it brings up the anger, depression, the guilt, all, all of those things. To be able to move forward, I like, if any of you watch him, I've spoken to him a couple of times, Jay Reid, I've spoken to him on his channel, he's spoken to me online. I love the way he phrases this. He says, you learn to start to live in defiance. And I think that's a great way of putting it. In order to move forward, first of all, I think what we need is a bit of distance. If you're still in that environment, it's very different because if you're still in that environment, I think of what maybe what you're looking at is ways to manage, ways to cope, ways of managing your boundaries and so on. But where there is a bit of distance, I think that's when healing starts. That's when our, our journey of healing starts. In that distance, in that space now, it could be an emotional distance, it could be an intellectual distance, it could be a physical distance. Maybe you've moved time, you've moved out of the house or whatever. It's in that distance you start to live a bit differently. And that might begin, this is what I said earlier on about paying attention to little things. You might notice little things like maybe your taste in music has changed. Maybe you're eating a different kind of food. Maybe you start to dress a little differently or you change your hairstyle. Wait till you get hair like mine. It's the only style you have like that. Enough, enough of my worries. Little things begin to change. What you're doing is you're getting to know yourself better. You may find yourself doing little things like maybe in work you start to talk to people you wouldn't normally talk to. Um, you might find yourself volunteering to do things you wouldn't normally do you take up you know some kind of a hobby or something what we're trying to do is we are getting to know ourselves a little bit better and i think it's maybe something that happens unconsciously but if you pay attention to it you start to see those little things you can also make a conscious effort and this is what it is to live in defiance maybe you start listening to the music that every time you put it on, they complained they had a sore head so you had to turn it off or you start to watch movies or TV shows that they would just talk over the top of so that you can, couldn't get watching it. They would complain about how awful the actor is or why do you watch that kind of nonsense. You start to do the things that you weren't allowed to do. That's living in defiance. You maybe start to either make new friends or you start to reconnect with the friends that you lost. The friends that they would have thrown a hissy fit if you'd have please link his personally referenced in the description i will indeed his name is jay reed his channel uh jay reed recovery from narcissistic childhoods his channel he's got a wealth of information i am actually going to put him in the link because something he does which i don't which i can't he has an online course uh, and he has a Facebook page for supporting people who have been in narcissistic relationships, um, particularly focuses on family dynamics, the upbringing and so on. But I'm going to put his details in the description of the video. Um, whatever resources, absolutely, whatever resources are there, please avail of them, because that's another thing to help you move forward. You, you utilize, you create, you utilize, you make the most of every resource there is. Think of what I do for a living. I'm a counselor. So the first thing I'm going to say is speak to a counselor. Okay. You can speak to a counselor to understand what's going on with you. Not necessarily what's going on with the other person. That's another thing that gets us stuck is when we overanalyze their behavior, trying to make sense of them because they make no bloody sense. Why would someone behave like this? Because ultimately they end up destroying themselves. And you're wondering who the hell does that? Go and do a counsellor. Yeah, you can help understand that, but you're more looking at yourself. What's going on with you, your own internal processes, the little things you can do to untangle yourself. It's a very American word that I do like it, uncoupling. Uncouple yourself, that part of you that's still maybe looking for them to, to apologize, to make it better. So there's counselling. Some people like life coaching. Life coaching is different. Um, I'm not a life coach, so 
any life coaches listening to this, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Life coaching is different. Life coaching is looking at your um, where you are and where you would like to be and helping you to utilize whatever skills you have and even develop new ones to get there because that could be becoming more assertive. That could be um, looking for that job that you want. That could be um, being able to manage your boundaries better. There's different counseling can do, or rather coaching can do a lot of different things. Some people go down the coaching route. Some people do both. There are support groups, um, even in local areas, um, face-to-face you know, groups for people. There's a lot of stuff online. As I say, Jay Reed has, uh, offers one on Facebook. It's an online one, so I'm going to put a link to that. There's a lot of different stuff. When you start talking to other people, a lot of the times you'll find your stories are very similar. A lot of people thinking, wow, that happened to me, and you know, my goodness, my ex did the same. Um, you know, they must have went to the same school or something. You know, there is something very normalizing about it, but there is also something very empowering about it because people support each other. One of the things I like about YouTube, I'm not great on social media. I dabble on social media, but I'm no expert. I, I just mess about with it. Even on YouTube, you can tell I tend to make this up as I go along. I don't know how to edit properly. I don't have titles and music and stuff. Um, one of the things that has really struck me in the videos, when people ask me to make a video and I make the video, I put it out. If I get enough people asking for the same kind of thing and, you know, I'll maybe take different suggestions and put them all into the one video to try and explain something. What really strikes me is the number of people who will support each other. They will talk to each other. They will say things like, yeah, that was just like my mom or that was just like my ex or whatever. I mean, I think that's really incredible. There's something very validating about that. And if I never get anything else out of doing uh, doing this, I think that has made it worthwhile. It has it connects people in a way they haven't been connected before, where they can share their stories, they can share their insights. So that connecting with others, making new friends, uh, reconnecting with old friends, even you know, if you were isolated from your family, trying to reconnect with your family. Um, someone's mentioned about being too old. 55 years, it's never too late. Absolutely not. I'm going to give you an example of being too old, okay? Now, you can tell I'm slightly over 30, okay? But I was talking to a friend of mine. His wife was thinking, you know, I would like to go back. I would like to go back to uni. I would like to study counseling. It sounds really interesting. She was just asking my advice. So I was telling her how long it would take, the sort of things you'd learn and the sort of things you have to go through and all the different processes. And I was telling her about the work. It's interesting. What got me interested in counseling is, is people. I think people are amazing. People are fascinating. I never met somebody, even the most toxic people, you know, the difficult people, I'm not talking about counseling, but even in real life. Um, everybody's interesting there's always something about somebody and that's why i like about, that's what i like about counseling because people are absolutely fascinating but i was telling her about this and i was really telling her my passion about people and she says well i'd really like to do it but she says by the time i graduate i'm going to be 50. and um it was just uh, my friend uh, her husband he he says well you know he says four years from now you're going to be 50 anyway so <laughs> You know, why not just do it? You know, you might not regret it. You know, you might be glad that you did it. I think that's a really good example. I mean, at what age are we actually too old to do something? Well, okay, maybe I'm a bit too old to be James Bond now. I'm a bit more George Smiley, but, you know, fair enough. It's never, I don't think it's ever too late for us to move forward, to move on. How we move on and what that life looks like is going to be different for everybody. I don't think there's a one size fits all. And it's your journey, okay? I don't think there's a right or a wrong. We will trip, we will fall, we will stumble, we will take a step back, we will have to take a step to the side and go round something. But one way or another, it is still a journey. And maybe there's no better time to start than either right now or first thing in the morning, okay? It's how we go about it. Being out of the environment, get back to it. I get sidetracked so easily, don't I? Um, 
being out of that environment can help because we do get to live in defiance. We do get to see there's nothing wrong with saying no. There's not necessarily anything wrong with doing things in our own best interest. If there's still some kind of contact, yeah, you are going to get some kind of grief. There's going to be some kind of criticism. But with that distance, it's easier to manage. And just on that, to be able to move forward, let's look at what keeps us stuck. I mentioned the things that the reasons we're stuck. So let's look at the things that keep us stuck or the things to maybe better way of putting it, the things to stop doing, if you will, to keep us stuck. If you have to have contact with that person or those people, if you have to, or even if you meet future people like that, think about what didn't work. Okay, I always think we learn from what doesn't work every bit as much as what does. So, for example, if you expected them to change, and they wouldn't, no matter what you did, you pleaded, you begged, compromised, you screamed, doesn't matter what it was, everything you did in order to try to get them to change, nothing worked. Maybe stop trying. Stop hoping they'll change. If they want to change, they will. And that's going to be entirely up to them. But we can't force it. The most we will ever do is influence someone. That's as much as we can do. Stop hoping they will change. If they promise that they have changed, again, it's entirely up to you whether or not you believe them. I think a good indicator is watching behavior, repeated patterns of behavior. That's why I often make it clear in my videos when I talk about, you know, um, being highly disagreeable, um, being highly resistant to criticism, um, being selfish, self-absorbed. Every single one of us is like this from time to time. All of us are. In certain moments, in certain situations, we can all be like that from time to time. What I try to make clear is it's a long-term persistent pattern. It is pervasive. It's like a default setting. So you're looking at a long-term consistent pattern. Someone promises have changed, observe the behavior. That's the biggest indicator, just observe the behavior. Not just the once, not just the twice, but long term. And even if they struggle, even if they slip back, if they're being genuine, they'll apologize and they will try to get better. They will do their best not to do it again. Other than that, maybe they're just telling you they're sorry, the promise have changed in order to get what they want. But stop expecting, stop hoping they're going to change. The second one is to stop explaining yourself. No matter how many times you explain to someone, someone who's maybe narcissistic, who is committed to be disagreeable, who's committed not to listen, no matter how many times you explain to them they decided, or whatever was going on, they didn't hear it. They didn't believe it. They didn't agree with it. They shut it down. They would pick up on one small part and they would twist that. And the more you try to explain yourself, the more you find yourself running around in circles. You drive yourself crazy. There's nothing wrong necessarily with giving an account of yourself, but that's not the same as an explanation. And what I mean by that is somebody asks you for something and you say, I can't do that. I wouldn't have the time and they keep going on yeah but you do have the time because of this that and the other you just repeat the same thing i won't be doing that i don't have the time and then they start saying but sure you could do this that and the other i won't be doing that i don't have the time do not need to over giving an account of yourself is one thing but trying to explain yourself to someone who has set out not to listen you're going to drive yourself insane and you're going to find yourself going through that same pattern over and over again so maybe stop explaining yourself. The next one is, do not get caught up in emotive arguments. A lot of the arguments you have with narcissistic people are emotive. They're not factual. They're not principled. They are emotive. Try to keep it factual. This is actually what happened. And that's as far as you have to go. And again, you don't, do not over explain yourself. You just keep it factual and keep repeating the same point. When it becomes a motive, that's often when it leaps from one thing to the next. And the next thing you know, you're accused of saying something about an episode of Friends back in 1998, that they're still hurting at today. 
as if that's got something to do with what we're talking about right now. You're going to go all over the place. You're driving yourself crazy. So try not to get drawn into emotive arguments. And I'm going to be very careful how I say this as well. You, it's okay to be the villain, but don't be the villain that they claim you are. Let me explain that. If you say no, you're the villain. If you don't give them what they want, you're the villain. If you don't back down, you're the villain. If you have boundaries, you are the villain. In their mind, you are the villain. So be the villain. Be the one with the boundaries. Be the one that says no. Be the one that wants to have a better life. Be the one that is better off without them. If that's what makes you a villain, then be their villain. Just let me put it to you this way. Every billionaire megalomaniac, James Bond is the villain. You know, every billionaire megalomaniac that's trying to take over the world, James Bond is the villain. So, you know, be the villain. But don't be the villain that they claim you are. I just thought of a quote, actually. Anybody here, I'm sure you've heard of it, if you've maybe read the book or you've seen one of the movies, The Count of Monte Cristo. It's one of my favorite books. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible story. I, I love it. Anybody that doesn't know the story, it's a young guy, Edmund Dantes. He ends up in ends ends up in, in prison for something like 14 years. And he ends up escaping. He meets the guy in the cell next to him. And you know, they're they're going to escape together. And while they're in prison, he works out why he's 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 in prison and he decides he wants vengeance and so on. But just before the escape, the old man next to him dies and he says something to him. I'm going to paraphrase it here. I can't remember it word for word, but I think it's 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 a wonderful thing to think about. He says to Edmund, when you get out, he says, do not commit the crime for which you now serve the sentence. Go and have your best life. Go and do good. I think that's it's a really good idea. So, yeah, you're going to be a villain by having boundaries, but don't be the villain they tell you are. Do not become the very thing that they accuse you of. Someone, I've just seen a flash there. Someone's talking about flashbacks. We are going to get flashbacks. Something I'm going to talk about triggers. A trigger is, if you will, it's an emotional memory. A trigger is, first of all, it's an external thing. It's a sight, a sound, a touch, a smell. Somebody says something, you hear something, whatever it is. And what that brings up is an emotional memory. We don't always remember something that happened cognitively, but we remember how it felt. Sometimes we have flashbacks and they're just little images that we have of the things that happened. Now, they can be very distressing. We can get triggered in many different ways. They don't all have to be distressing. We can get triggered in ways that are, that we can be triggered in ways that are very exciting. We can get triggered in ways we're bored. We'll have to do the ironing. Who likes doing the ironing? I certainly don't. Every time I think of doing the ironing, I get bored. That's a trigger. So we all have different triggers. It's the really disturbing, distressing ones that we try our best to avoid. And every time something comes up, we're doing our best to avoid it. This is where counseling can really help. It can help you manage some of those memories, help you to process and put them into a context. But in the meantime, something that can help whenever we find ourselves being triggered. First of all, recognize it. Somebody might do or say something. Someone that's been with you a long time, they know what buttons to push. They'll be pushing those buttons to try to get some kind of reaction. Sometimes we might just be doing something and it just pops into our head. As I'm talking right now, something might be popping into your head. Most thoughts are automatic. They do pop into our head. We can either engage with them or we can choose to let them go. What we're not doing is we're not pushing them out of our head. That sometimes makes it worse. The more, dis more we try to get rid of it, avoid it, the more distressing it comes back. Little things to help whenever those things come up, the rumination, the flashbacks and things like that. Remind yourself of what you're doing right now. 
where you are right now. This helps with updating your memory as well. For instance, right now, I'm listening to a guy from Belfast talking on YouTube. Right now, I'm brushing my teeth. Right now, I'm doing the ironing. Right now, I'm going to have a coffee. You remind yourself of what you're doing right now in this moment. Recognize as well, right now, I happen to think. Right now, I have the thought. Or even right now, I have the memory. Remember what it is. And it may be distressing. It may be uncomfortable. But you acknowledge it for what it is. It's a thought and it's in this moment. It will pass. It always does. Then go back to doing whatever it is you're doing. And even the feelings that come up with it. Our breathing starts to change. Our heart rate, our heart rate changes. We might start to shake. We might start to sweat. We all have different physical reactions. Acknowledge what you're feeling right now. Right now, I happen to feel anxious. Right now, I happen to feel uncertain. Right now, I happen to feel angry. Whatever it is we're feeling, acknowledge it. Don't try and push it away. Don't try and avoid it. Acknowledge it for what it is and allow it to subside. Again, go back to doing what you were doing just prior to it came over you. That's not necessarily going to get rid of it, but it might help you to manage these things a little bit better. I can't really go into depth on YouTube. It's something maybe to talk about with, with, with your therapist. They can help you manage it in a more constructive, better one-to-one -one than, than I can just over a video. But those little things, what you're doing is you're grounding yourself. You're putting yourself back into the present, back into the here and now, because a lot of the times when we get flashbacks, what we're thinking or what we're feeling, what we sometimes believe is yesterday's situation is present today. Yesterday's threat is present today. It feels like it is, but that's not the same as it is. And it's learning to recognize the difference. I'm so glad I saw that comment because I would have forgotten to mention the trigger. So I do appreciate that. And I do hope that you're able to ground yourself a little bit better. Um, where did I get to? The other thing is being able to draw on your strengths, draw on your qualities. The things, again, living in defiance and living in, in the absence of that person. You recognize the qualities you had beforehand, but also recognize the qualities that you developed during that. And they may have been qualities that you were told weren't qualities. They were weaknesses. They were foolish or they were selfish, whatever it is. You probably have pretty good problem solving skills. You probably have good negotiation skills. You probably have a good healthy level of, of assertiveness, for example, in work or with other people or with friends or, you know, with whatever new partner you're with or, or whatever. Um, recognize those strengths. And here's another strength. I often call this an advantage. Narcissistic people tend to think very much in the here and now. They're very much ego driven. It's all about instant gratification. How do I win right now? What makes me look good right now? How do I shut this person down right now? What gets me what I want right now? So it's very instant. You have the ability to think tomorrow. You have the ability to think next week. You have the ability to think a year from now, five years from now. And that's your advantage. Draw on your strengths. Think about your preferred future. How do you get there from here? What is it you need? What's missing? What could be helpful? The narcissistic person, even though they seem to be having their best life, they're still living very much in the moment, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just talked about being in the moment. But that's a lot of the time that's all they can do. It's very instant. The ability to think ahead I think it's wonderful. And okay, here's second movie tonight example. Um, if you think of the Shawshank Redemption, it's, it's it's a great movie. It's a fantastic movie. You think of that poor guy, Andy, everything he went through. What people didn't realize is he was thinking ahead. One handful of dirt a day chipped away at the wall and emptied out from his pocket the next day. Pretty much one handful of dirt a day. He was thinking ahead. While people thought they were manipulating him, no, he was setting himself up so that he could get away. He was thinking ahead. Maybe that's a poor example. <laughs> um, but I'm just saying, having that ability to think ahead. And that's an advantage we often have over people who can only think in the moment. Mm -hmm. Because they maybe think they've won that battle. They don't realize that maybe you're thinking more in terms of winning the war. Um, getting ahead, having your best life. Mentioned the triggers, the emotional memories, um, looking as well at your boundaries. 
another way to help you is to recognize what your boundaries are because in that relationship and even coming out of that relationship those boundaries are probably still on some level are going to be chipped away at your boundaries are flexible they are yours okay they do not have to be rigid you can change those boundaries your boundaries with one person might be different from they are with another because that's a completely different relationship you may have a core you may have some red lines and that's fair enough but you think of your boundaries I often think of boundaries as knowing your values, your limits, your integrity, your self-respect. And we also have different kinds of boundaries. There's physical boundaries. Okay, and we we don't want to be physically hurt. We don't we physically we don't want people in our space. We don't want uh, even our own personal property. That's our physical boundaries. We don't want people taking our stuff, giving it away to other people or damaging it. There's intellectual boundaries. People can criticize us and disagree with us, but that's different from being harsh, being abrasive, being judgmental. We have emotional boundaries. You have every right to feel what you feel. By the way, so do they. But you have every right to feel what you feel. There are your feelings, you own them. And it's not for anybody to devalue them. Now, your feelings may be out of proportion to what you feel. They might not be an accurate reflection of what's really happening. They might be dysregulated somehow, but that does not mean they're not honest and it does not mean they're not yours. You have every right to feel them. In a relationship with a narcissistic person, we often find our feelings being undermined, being criticized, being made fun of, or being told there's something wrong with us for feeling anything. Not true. Your feelings are yours, so you have emotional boundaries as well. We have lots of different kinds of boundaries. I will go in more in depth. Um, I will go more in depth in, in a future video about boundaries. There was a question that was asked that I would like to ask just as we come towards the end, and that's trying to help someone else. Helping someone else to recognize that the person in their lives is maybe abusing them. Now, that could be a parent, it could be a sibling, it could be a friend, it could be their partner, whatever. How you do that, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way, but what I will say is things to avoid. Trying to trying to push them too much. We can ask them questions like, well, if someone treated me like that, would you be okay with it? Or, you know, if someone were to tell someone else that sort of thing, do you think that would sound fair? I mean, we can do little things like that to invite people to think about things. Um, what we can't do is we can't try and push someone into accepting something because, especially if it's a long-term relationship, um, a lifelong thing, uh, you know, 10, 20 years, whatever it is, it can be very difficult to try and wrench someone out of that because maybe it's been deeply ingrained in them. It could be, um, it could be their relationship is completely different when they're, when they're on their own. We really don't know. It could be that there are children involved. It could be that there is money involved. There's property involved. There could be a lot of things that keeps that person there. That person might know as well what's going on but it is very difficult for them to articulate it they are not in that place to be able to say yes i know what do you think i should do so to help someone who is maybe being abused by someone else you do it very gently you do it very tenderly you do it with as much compassion as you have because they could be hurting in ways that you just can't see they could be hurt. The thought of breaking away or coming away from that might cause them a lot of pain. They have to, just like if you've left a, a narcissistic relationship, a difficult relationship, there was a lot of things that you maybe had to navigate before you were able to leave. Well, they're probably the same. Do you know what? I'm just thinking as I'm talking about this, I actually made a video on this. Um, yeah, there's a video about, you know, how do I tell someone or how do I support someone? Um, it's it's on one of my playlists. I really should know my own channel better. Um, if you have a look at that, there'll be information in that to help you. But whatever it is you do, remember, they may be in a different place. They may be seeing something similar, but still different at the same time. And they're not in that place where they're ready to make a clean break. They might need your help and support. Allow them to ask you. They might need your help and support in being able to do that. But what we cannot do, unfortunately, no matter how much we care about them, even if we are being hurt as well, 
unfortunately what we cannot do is we cannot tear them away from it sometimes we might do more harm than good because we don't really know what's going on there so tonight has went in very quickly i've pretty much come to the end um i hope tonight has been helpful for you again it's not necessarily a quick fix these are not ideas that are going to you know fix things like that but they might help you along the path recognizing the things that prevent us from being able to move forward that part of us that is stuck in the past the part of us that is still maybe um entangled somehow that need for some kind of justice that need for some kind of validation looking at the things we can do as well recognizing that we are actually grieving even though we don't really see it as grieving there is there is part of us that is grieving but it, we're often grieving what we would have liked to have had what we were promised what we sometimes feel as if we were cheated out of we are also grieving that part of ourselves that is maybe still stuck there i mean again talking about flashbacks and things it's sometimes it's like part of us is still there every time the distress comes up it's like yesterday's situation yesterday's threat is present today i'm right back there these ideas can help um ultimately i will say what i said at the beginning working with a therapist working with a counselor um, again some people prefer life coaching if that's a the direction they want to go getting some kind of support does make it easier i often feel if you think of how isolated you were in that situation not being isolated having people around you people that are going to bring out the best in you and they're going to be in your corner they're going to support you that sometimes makes our, our getting unstuck that little bit easier and sometimes as i said you pay attention because sometimes we're becoming unstuck in ways we haven't even noticed because we are listening to the music that they didn't like we are eating the food that they disapproved of you know just pay attention to those little things and each and every little thing is a victory so everybody just going to have a little look at some of the questions mt you found it very helpful that's great i'm so glad you did alvaro thank you your videos helped me a lot that's good i'm good the biggest problem with good psychology by the time i find them they already become you do and don't need new clients believe me it's not that i don't need new clients it's just that i'm full at capacity um this is the thing about my practice i work in private practice and there's only one of me there's only so many people i can see <coughs> on me um you want to find a good therapist there's a lot of places um, a lot of directories online a lot of therapists um they have little bios and they talk about what they specialize in the sort of um, issues they work with um read those because you'll get an idea of whether or not they can help a lot of therapists myself included um have no problem with maybe like a 10 or a 15 minute phone call to arrange that just so that you can have a chat to see if if it's the sort of person you feel comfortable working with because um you know i'm a big believer in carl rogers he believed the therapeutic process most of the work is done in the relationship between the therapist and the client so as often as i can if, if a client wants it i have no issue with the client talking to me for about 10 or 15 minutes over the phone because they will get an idea if they think i would be a good fit for them if they think i would be able to help them I don't feel offended if if they would prefer someone else i mean I, I i take no offense to that it's their process it's important they get the help they need so there's a lot of directories online that do advertise therapists and as i say they have different little bios what they specialize in they have a picture of them and so on some put a little video up to introduce themselves have a look at them and if if they're available if, if they allow you to do it you know give them a call have a chat or book some kind of a consultation and you'll get an idea of whether or not they'll be able to help you okay and thank you story sounds familiar even in thriving now got that now um got three cameras in my apartment thank you for the insights some reactions as grief is keeping one stuck rather than unnameable invisible shame that is and um, that is a really good way of putting it sometimes we're stuck it feels like an invisible unbreakable chain we're stuck and we don't know why remember our brains don't like things that don't make sense that's why we that's why we analyze things that's why we keep going off um keep going over the same things again and again we wonder what they're doing now what are they up to now what are they saying to the other person about me now 
our brains just keep going over it and it, it feels like we're stuck the grieving part as well it's stuck and grieving is not just feeling sad as i said there's a lot of different parts to grieving. there's a lot of different things going on there's anger there's guilt there's depression there's denial there's a lot of different stuff going on yeah being able to name it i think is a good place to be able to start once you have a name for it you have a good idea what you're working with you have a good idea as well as what might be useful to help you if you think of uh, i think it was about a month or so ago i did a live stream i talked about three questions to help people get unstuck the first one is can i change it there's some things we can't change we can't change the past we can't change other people so we look at what we can change can we change our approach can we change the direction we're going can we change how we respond there's a lot of different things we can look at when it comes to change what would it look like what would we do with it even if we had it what would be different what would be better the second one is can i accept it remember what i said a moment ago accepting something doesn't mean we're okay with it no stretch of the imagination doesn't mean we're okay with it we're acknowledging it is what it is they are what they are they're not for changing or whatever that happens to look like and the third question is can i let it go which can be one of the most difficult things we'll ever do but it can also be one of the most liberating because letting go of something doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean any of those things. It doesn't mean it's not important. Sometimes when we're deciding or choosing to try to let something go, all we're saying to ourselves is, this is not wasting any more of my damn time. This has consumed far too much of me. That's all we're doing. We're not denying anything. But when we decide to let something go, Maybe we've accepted it. And when we've accepted it, we're now free to change something. Those three questions are all linked. If you missed the first live stream, go back and have a look at that. I go into a little bit more depth. But listen, as always, it's it's been it's been fun. I had no idea how much I could rabbit on. Um I do waffle quite a bit, don't I? Um yeah, um, and you'll notice tonight you can probably see me a bit clearer. I've got my proper camera set up not my little webcam one so you can see all the lines in the gray um this has been fun um what i did is i put up questions what you might like me to look at what i might do in future is i might just ask a question what would you like me to cover and whatever the consensus is in the suggestions if i get you know more people asking for one certain thing that's what i'll cover does that sound fair enough to everybody because other than that i just come up with my own ideas uh, like to revisit the getting stuff and grief talk again. Focused on grief, relaxed behavior. Thank you. If you want, that is something I will put together in a video that I could do. Um, I could even just take little snippets from this and try and put them together to cover that. Or if I do a video, I will go a little bit more in depth for you. And thank you, Darren McGee. You're welcome, Gypsy Lil. Gypsy Lil, nice to see you again tonight. And self talk, good evening. And yes, sir, no waffling to me, Darren. It's all helpful. DJ H, record hound, you're far too kind. <laughs> um, thanks for the reminder. I can be defined. Yeah, remember what I said about being defined. Be the villain, just don't be the villain they accuse you of being. Do not, as the guy in the Count of Monte Cristo said, I think it's a great line when you get out, when you're free, do not commit the crime for which you now serve the sentence. Do not be, do not become the version of you that they paint you to be. Be the best version of yourself. Sometimes that is enough to be their villain. Folks, it's been absolutely great. Again, I'll do this again two weeks time. And I'm going to put up a question um, maybe in a week or so. I'll put that up in the community tab for suggestions for topics to cover. Because then that will give me about a week to get an idea of what the consensus is. And I will put something together. Okay. In the meantime, everybody look after yourselves. Take care and thanks for watching.